Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing reducing poverty in the global South using data and research with special guest Annie Duflo, Executive Director of Innovations for Poverty Action. Annie, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so interested in the work that you're doing because you occupy a, a, a really important and also fairly unique slot in, in this ecosystem uh, of nonprofits. So I'm going to set this up just by pointing out uh, to those uh, uh, in the audience who are not as, as immersed in the topic as you are, that 50 million people, about 8% of the world's population live in extreme poverty and subsist on less than $2.15 daily, with most concentrated in sub-Saharan Africa and conflict-affected and rural areas of the global South. So we have a huge, huge issue here. 8% of the uh, the world's population, this is endemic, right? Year after year after year, children are growing up in these kinds of circumstances and families are trying to navigate them. So let's talk about IPA and the work that you do because you're not providing direct services. You're not actually providing food uh, directly or particular uh, services directly. You take a different cut. So talk about IPA and how you work with your partners to make a contribution to solving this really important problem. Great. Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's really uh, exciting to be with you today. And yes, you're right. Um, Our motto is at IPA, more evidence, less poverty. And in brief, we try to address two problems that we see in the world. Uh, The first problem is that uh, often programs and policies that are designed to help people living in poverty are not necessarily informed by data and and evidence. And that means that often they are not the most cost-effective programs and policies uh, or not as effective as others could be, right? And that leads to potentially wasted resources. And... Billions of dollars are being spent every year by international development organizations and by governments of low and middle uh, country governments themselves. So it's really important that we understand how to spend these resources effectively. I know some people will argue that we know what to do. We just need to spend even more money. And other people will argue that uh, this is all wasted money. We should uh, reduce the, the spending. And the reality is, kind of, you know, it's more complex, more, more nuanced. Uh, the reality is that you know, some programs work um, for some people in some places, uh, but others don't, or maybe they don't for everyone. So our goal at IPA is to uh, shed some light on these questions and to understand which interventions work best and importantly, which interventions do not work uh, as well. So that's let the first me, uh, problem. Let me make a comparison, Annie. When you are thinking about where money flows, where you are going to invest, you want to maximize return on investment. It actually, is it it any different than any other investment? If I'm investing in a house, I want to make sure that the house has value. If I'm investing in people, I want to make sure that the people have an advantage. If I'm investing in a stock, I want to make sure that it's a good investment and I'm going to get a positive return. Aren't you just using those same kind of ideas of of understanding what actually works, whether it's in the financial markets or in uh, the, the effort to alleviate hunger before you make the investment and then sharing that knowledge with others? Right, absolutely. I think that's that's a good comparison. You know, another comparison that we often use, also because uh, there are simili- similarities in the methodologies that we use, is uh, the medical world. Um, so we, in fact, use a, a similar methodology to what's used to assess the effectiveness of medicines to understand which programs work. We use randomized control trials for the most part. Um, so that's another good comparison. So randomized. Until- Randomized control trials. So in other words, you will set up a test, you will do an investment at a modest level and see what the effect is. Is that what you're saying? That's right. So the idea of a randomized control trial is that 
you want to isolate the impact of an intervention from other things like passage of time or you know intrinsic characteristics of of people and that's what a randomized control trial allows you to do by comparing you know people who get programmed to other people who who don't uh you know, it, in its most simple form so very similar again to what the medical world does to to test the effectiveness of medicines now that th this is so very interesting because the the number of different competencies and they're very distinctive in order to even think about the these approaches you have the approaches of financial investors, so that thinking. You have the uh, the approaches of economists. You have the approaches of medicine, right? You're actually developing models and ways of, of, of setting up data, testing it, challenging the veracity of that data that is incredibly sophisticated and is drawn from a lot of different places. How do you assemble the expertise in one organization that is so very distinct and that will challenge each other? So, for example, the randomized control trial that you talk about out of medicine is completely distinct from an approach that is used for investing in stock, right? So those people are going to challenge each other depending on the circumstance. How do you actually hold this all together with all these different experts and all this different thinking? That, that's a great question. And I, I will add one layer of uh, complexity, I guess, to, to this. Um, and that's the second problem that uh, we're trying to address that I was referring to. And that's the fact that even when evidence exists, it's not necessarily being used by decision makers to you know, inform the programs and policies. And to address this problem, we engage very closely with decision makers you know, throughout the research process, starting with the identification of research questions to you know, champion and support the use of evidence and, and share you know, this evidence to, to the right people at the right time. So this takes you know, another kind of expertise, which is very much you know, relationship based. Um, so I'll tell you, to answer your question, I'll tell you a little bit about how this all works. Uh, our model is very much based on, on partnerships, right? So we see IPA as uh, a facilitator, a, a connector, an organization that brings all of this together. So we work with a network of researchers uh, from various academic institutions, very often economists as well as behavioral economists. But we work with you know, people from other disciplines as well because we work across a number of of areas where we need some sector expertise. We, of course, work in partnership with decision makers, right, uh, very closely to both to identify questions that need to be answered, to identify or design potential solutions, and then to test you know, the impact of these solutions together, you know, hand in hand with, with our partners. Uh, and at IPA, we have a diverse set of skills. Uh, we have people who understand how to run research studies with high quality. Uh, we also have people who you know, have sector expertise in various areas. And we have people whose uh, job is to build relationship with decision makers to understand what the key questions are, who the key players are. So it's really about bringing together different types of actors and and creating you know, a set of skills and capacity within the organization to engage with these various stakeholders. You also make a, a very interesting point, and that is the whole question of meeting the, the, the counterparts who are on the ground in their thought process, right? Understanding their perspective, satisfying them that you are providing value to them on the ground, as well as to uh, donor constituencies and, and, and others. So there is a matter of cultural competence as well. And just uh, here, I'm a dual national uh, US and German citizenship. Um, you, you speak with a French accent, so I'm assuming that you have uh, either uh, a French or a Francophile uh, uh, background, uh, maybe Canadian, but... Um, how do you put together your international teams? And when you talk about academic teams, I assume you're talking internationally and not only internationally, but academic teams that include uh, academic members who are on the ground in the global south who might have a much deeper personal knowledge 
of, of the situation on the ground. Is that correct? That's right. So we have a network of uh, 20 country officers. Uh, across Africa, Latin America, and, and Asia. So those country officers are really the heart of our operations. 90% of our own staff are based out of our country officers and are from these countries, right? So those, those country officers allow us to run really high quality research. Over time, we've built really strong expertise in you know, running studies and collecting high quality data. But this in-country presence also allows us to be long-term relationships with decision makers in their form understanding what the key questions are who the key players are what are the right forums to share this evidence uh, etc so those teams um, in these countries work uh, in partnership with academics who are not necessarily based in those countries so we work with academics from various universities a lot of them in the us and and in europe uh, they don't need to be necessarily based in country because our teams you know, are there on the ground, you know, managing the day-to-day -day work. Um, that being said, you know, it is um, really important for us to increase our engagement with and the participation of researchers from the countries where we work. Uh, it's really important to uh, build a really strong understanding of the local context, uh, to build long-term relationships with decision makers, um, and, you know, among many other reasons why that's important. Uh, and that's something that we're very much focused on is to um, in increase our engagement and participation of researchers and research institutions in the countries where, where we work. I'd like to talk with you a little bit about the enabling technologies like this technology that we have today that make your job easier, but also challenge some of the assumptions of your job. You know, nowadays, we are inundated by data. And sometimes data takes over reality because some data is easier to acquire, some data is more difficult to acquire. Academics have this issue where they tend to uh, focus on data that is easier to acquire, where there's a lot of data, they analyze that data, but on the ground, that data can be disconnected from reality, how do you deal with this issue of volume and quality of data, accessibility of data through electronic means versus the laborious process of collecting it manually and making it accessible, where you might have more valid data that is more scarce and less valid data that is more plentiful? How do you deal with, with that uh, aspect of your analysis? That's a really good question, Mark, and definitely something we could speak about like all day, I think. <laughs> so um, traditionally, you know, we've been mostly collecting our own data, actually. Uh, in the last 20 years, I would say that, you know, 90% of, maybe 95% of the studies that we've run, and you know, that's nine, 900 plus studies at this point, uh, rely on data that we have collected. So a lot so of our so you created a you create an integrated process where you are satisfied that the data that comes together is all at, on the same basis in that um, you don't have quality data then suddenly mixed with with lack of quality data right and and it just starts to make all of your conclusions questionable. You actually have from your very beginning created this integrated approach to assure that the, that, that the fundamental data is clean so that the analysis ends up downstream being much better. That's right. So you, you know, you collect, that allows you to collect data from the sample with whom you're working, because with the kind of studies we do, you know, you need to uh, select your sample in a certain way, and that allows you to, you know, control the quality of the data and often just access data that wouldn't exist otherwise. Um, so, yes, a lot of our work the last 20 years have involved, you know, building strong research capacity and experience, you know, among other things, the capacity of collecting high quality data. And that's one of the reasons why this, you know, in-country presence has been so important. Now, you raised a really good question, you know, that also means that this is precious data. It's, you know, that's what drives the cost of studies, really. It's the cost of data collection. And we live now in a world where increasingly, you know, there is a lot of data that's available. You know, it was 
quite different you know, 20 years ago when, when we started this work. Um, so now the question is, you know, how can we um, make use of the data that, that's, that's out there and how can that complement the, the work that we do? Um, so there are a couple of different things. You know, one is the availability of administrative data uh, in the organizations that we work with. So whether we work with governments, nonprofits, they have administrative data. Uh, there is a wealth of data there. The quality is not always the greatest, but one of the things that we're actually working on is to um, support some of our partner organizations in strengthening the quality of their administrative data. So we have a number of partnerships with government to do just that, um, which should you know, allow using it more confidently for research purposes, but also for day-to-day -day, you know, monitoring and evaluation purposes, right? So. So that's one uh, dimension. Another you know, dimension is just big data, right? Uh, uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, you know, how will that change the landscape of what we do? Um, the answer is, you know, I don't <laughs> totally know yet, but you know, there are researchers working on combining machine learning approaches with uh, the type of research that we do. So. In machine learning analysis doesn't necessarily allow you, at least at this point, to infer causality. Right? So uh, was it really the impact of this particular intervention that caused the change, right? Uh, but machine learning analysis allows you to really complement the kind of work we do uh, with, you know, it allows to add a lot more nuances to the kind of analysis that we do, for example, understanding why did this program work for this type of people and not for this other type of people? And that's where combining what we've been doing with, you know, the new approaches that are out there can will probably be very powerful in the future. And then there is this whole intersection with between data, fact, and human behavior. And even fact gets warped. If I'm a scientist and I'm looking for a grant to study something, and I want the data to show that the thing that I'm studying is worthy of being funded. So I have an interest in having the data show certain things. If I'm a government and I want to show that my government is being effective, I also have an interest. If I'm a community leader or if I am seeking some sort of support on a local level for a school or for an agricultural project, I have an interest. So we have a whole bunch of human behaviors here that are distinct from data. How do you deal with that aspect of, of human interest that can shift and becomes part of the political process where data can be used to tell a particular story simply by focusing on one cluster of data? It doesn't mean that it's untrue, but by not allowing other data that challenges my story to come in, I'm helping myself. How do you deal with with that with that issue? Because that is not a data science issue. It's a human behavior issue. It's a psychology issue. That's right. Yes. Well, I think that's why it's really important for uh, governments, nonprofits, any organization to work with um, researchers or research institutions that are you know independent from them, and that you know, we don't have a vested interest in the outcomes of the research, you know, nor do the, the researchers who work with us. Um, so, you know, this, this relationship um, is, is important. Um, now I can tell you how um, we approach, you know, the, the our second objective, which is, which is to ensure that evidence you know, is used to inform uh, programs and, and policies, is used to inform to, you know, is used to actually, you know, change behaviors. Um, and that's a three-pronged approach. The, the first is really to ensure that the research questions we ask are uh, relevant to you know, the decision makers with whom we work. And to do that, we really emphasize uh, the, the co-creation process. And by that, I mean researchers and decision makers working hand in hand you know, throughout the research process, starting with the identification of research questions. That helps build buy-in for the use of data and evidence. It helps um, 
uh, it helps ensure that the questions we ask are relevant. So that's the first uh, process. So the first thing you do is you create a context that basically allows me to present and allows you to present and allows other people, people to present. And what you're doing is you're creating a network of agreements of how we're going to do this. And in that process, you're surfacing um, perhaps priorities that each of us might have that are not consistent with your objective of, of finding clean data. That's You start off that way. Talk about the second aspect of this three-legged stool. So the, the second is, um, is about supporting um, directly supporting the use and the application of, of evidence. So often when we work with partners to um, figure out if something worked, you know, we will continue to work with them to then help them scale this approach based on uh, evidence. Uh, so one example, um, I many years ago uh, started working with the Ministry of Education in Ghana. That's one of the countries where we have an office. Um, and we started by sharing with them uh, evidence from other countries, actually, about an approach that had been very effective at increasing learning levels. And that's what we call the targeting instruction at the right level approach, where you ensure that children are being taught at their level. Um, because you know, levels vary a lot within a, a classroom, and that's, that's a big issue for teachers. So we, we shared this evidence from other countries with them, and um, they were interested in testing this approach in the Ghanaian context. So we first had to, you know, we had to work together on understanding how this could be adapted to the Ghanaian context. So we spent a lot of time just thinking about how the initial approach, the initial concept could be adapted without, you know, departing completely from the, uh, from what made the approach successful in the first place, right? So and then we evaluated this approach in Ghana, um, and then you know identified that one of the approaches we tested was was the most effective, and we are now providing technical assistance basically to to the Ghanaian government to help them scale this uh, approach in in Ghana, you know, through the through the school system. So that's, that's so, you know, the second approach. That's so interesting. So the first approach is is to set the context. The second, the second approach is to exchange information in both directions, right? You're providing an example, they're providing feedback, and then you're reshaping in collaboration. That collaboration of sharing expertise, the respect that each side shows for the expertise of the other, so you're engaging in a real dialogue. What is the third element of this three-legged stool? Like derives from the first two actually, and 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 often you know originates from the two first types of partnership I described, and that's really about building, uh, working with our partners to build a culture and build capacity to use data and evidence you know, within our partner institutions. So, so there's so, two two more steps. So so you're you're actually building an independence. Not only so you're not building codependence, you're providing information, you're you're providing the context, you're you're shaping these these projects, but you're also leaving an enhanced capability uh, in your partners so that they can use these tools going forward. So you're actually advancing independence through this. That's right. Yes, the idea is to uh, to institutionalize this you know capacity to to some extent. So we have two two models that. You know, help us achieve that. One is what we call the right fit evidence unit. That's basically an advisory services unit that advises various types of organizations to uh, help them develop a right fit monitoring and evaluation and learning strategy. So this goes beyond impact evaluation. This is really about, you know, what do I need to learn and how am I going to learn it and what kind of data do I need for this? And then another model is uh, similar, but really focused on working with governments. And we call that the embedded lab model, where the goal is to, you know, we work hand in hand with our government partners to build embedded capacity within a certain ministry to use data and evidence. So this could be evidence that's based on, you know, the type of impact evaluations uh, I described earlier, but this could be also be about 
strengthening the capacity to use administrative data to monitor you know, the day-to-day -day implementation of, of programs. And in fact, in Ghana, with the Ministry of Education, we have been working with them to, to build an embedded lab. And that's really you know, been a natural next step after working together on generating evidence and then working together on scaling this evidence. Uh, so there is one unit of the Ministry of Education that's uh, actually already uh, internalized uh, what we've worked on together and you know, has recruited their own statistician to uh, now uh, implement the, the monitoring strategy of schools that we developed together. This is so very interesting. I'd like to to close, since we're coming to the end, I'd like to, to close on a, on, on a global uh, question for you. I'm very sensi sensible, sensitive to the fact that um, the G20 countries are very often um, in their history colonizing powers. And it's an irony of American history that America was colonized. It was a it was a country that was um, that was created by a number of different other countries. And then through the revolution, threw off that colonization yoke, and then also was itself a perpetrator of co colonialist type uh, policies, which we have now tried uh, in a halting way to change, right? France has the same issue, right? So does Germany. So do all the European countries, Belgium and so on and so forth. And there are a lot of sins to make up for for that. It seems to me that part of what you're doing is redefining the relationships away from this uh, co colonialist or neo-colonialist or sphere of influence type of uh, power structure to a different type of relationship. Am I getting that right in terms of how your organization is put together and the attitude that you have toward people across the world and toward, toward people in the global South? Yeah, that, that's a great question and, you know, an important team, I guess, in the international development sector these days, right? Decolonizing development, which you know, means a, a lot of different things, of course, and it's in sort of a multi-pronged uh, issue. Um, I think, yeah, I think you're right. Uh, you know, for us, it's it's always been um, really important to uh, to build this very strong local presence. Um, and um, and really you know, work with our partners to uh, embed and institutionalize this this capacity within our, our partner institutions. Now, I think the important piece that you know, I mentioned earlier for us is to uh, increase the engagement and the participation of researchers from the countries where we work uh, in in this work. You know, that's that's something where we still need to make progress and something that we're very proactively you know, working on. Well, it's interesting. The attitude is less coercive. It's more partnering. It's more exchange. It's very respectful, right? The idea that um, that expertise resides in just one place or knowledge just resides in one place, that's out the window. And what you're trying to do is to figure out a different way, not only of addressing problems, but the approach to addressing problems is going to be much more collaborative. And you're trying to model that in how you assemble your organization, how you recruit to your organization, how you interact with partners. It's a very, very sophisticated approach. And it's I'm so grateful, Annie, that uh, that you were able to share uh, this with us. What is your next objective over the next five years for uh, Innovations for Poverty Action? Thanks. That's a great question. We are celebrating our 20th anniversary. so. A, a good time to to ask this question. Um, so a couple of things. You know, the the first is uh, to continue pushing the boundaries of uh, research topics and and research methods. Right, there are a lot of questions out there uh, that still lack evidence. Um, the the most you know, recent programs that that we have created include uh, human trafficking uh, and forced displacement. So those are complex topics, as as you can imagine. Um, and you know there are other topics that um, really need rigorous evidence, um, and that are extremely important for all times. You know, climate change obviously is, is one. 
um, mental health and its interactions with poverty is, is, is another one. So we want to continue pushing the boundaries of the research topics that we address uh, and research methods as well to ensure that our methods you know, continue to be responsive and, and increase their responsiveness to policy makers and decision makers needs. So we talked a little bit about you know, leveraging big data and the new approaches out there. So you know, that's certainly something that we need to, to be thinking about. Um, so that's one. The second is that we want to really double down on you know, ensuring that the evidence we generate translates into real impacts and, and, and policies. We have you know, several examples of that, uh, old and recent ones. You know, during the pandemic, for example, uh, some of our research affiliates uh, from Yale uh, worked in, in Bangladesh to understand what was the best way to encourage people to wear masks. Uh, they you know, identified one approach that was most successful at increasing the, the wearing of, of masks. And you know, this was during um, Delta in, in 2021. And this approach was then adopted by several organizations in, in South Asia to, um, to touch millions of, of people. So that's you know, one of the very recent examples of um, real impact of, of the research. Um, so we want to, to double down on um, on that, you know, by furthering the, the three approaches that I mentioned, right? Co-creation co with our partners, supporting the scale up of effective solutions and building embedded capacity through our embedded labs and our right fit evidence unit. Um, and third, you know, increasing our engagement with um, uh, researchers from the countries where we work, as I mentioned, you know, is something that uh, we are increasingly focusing on. So there, those are three areas of um, important focus for us in the next five years. Annie Duflo, it's been such a pleasure to learn from you. Thank you so much for helping to educate me and to help uh, our viewers to, uh, to gain insight of this highly leveraged work that you do that has so much impact. Please thank your boards, your staff, your partners, uh, the academics who collaborate with you and the institutions uh, that that collaborate with you. And thank you so much for your insight. It's just been a really wonderful discussion. Great. Thank you so much for your great questions and your interest. It was a pleasure.